Jim, you're good to go. Good afternoon. This is James Turkowski, Executive Director of the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research. And I wish to uh, thank you for joining us for this broadcast today. AVER is a 501c3 educational foundation and through its Decade of Vision 2010 to 2020 initiative, holds a series of educational briefings on a variety of vision issues. Today's broadcast is a briefing entitled Thyroid Eye Disease, What Have We Learned from Research? This is the second year that we're doing this type of a um, broadcast on thyroid eye disease, but this year is very special because it is the first annual Thyroid Eye Disease Awareness Week being held during the week of November 16th to 20th, 2020. So thank you for joining us during Thyroid Eye Disease Awareness Week for this latest information about this disease and its impact on patients. We are bringing attention to this disease as it has significant quality of life challenges for patients. Now, uh, we have a streaming being done today through our partnership with ARVO, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology. And I wish to thank ARVO's Aaron Herring for keeping us all on track here today and for getting me out, in, out of any scrapes I may get into here. Um, uh, Aaron has asked me to remind you all that you can go to the chat pane on the right side of your screen to submit any questions, and we will be reviewing those and responding to those later in the broadcast. Um, it is our intent, like with all the other AVER congressional briefings, is to develop a summary uh, of today's uh, event and to also have a recording of this event. So if you found it very interesting and stimulating, uh, or you'd like to educate colleagues about it, uh, we, we will then be able to provide a link to get to a summary and a recording. So without further ado, I would like to uh, invite and uh, introduce our first speaker today, and that is Dr. Gary Lelly. Dr. Lelly serves as the Vice Chair of Ophthalmology at Weill Cornell Medicine. He is a board certified ophthalmologist specializing in oculoplastic surgery. He attended the University of Michigan and Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York and completed his residency in ophthalmology at the University of Michigan's Kellogg Eye Center. He's gained broad clinical and surgical experience during his fellowship in oculoplasty surgery while treating patients at Columbia University Medical Center, Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital, New York University Hospital, Bellevue Medical Center, and New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. Dr. Lelly, welcome. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate the kind introduction and uh, appreciate uh, uh, Aver and Arvo uh, hosting this webinar. And I also, of course, appreciate Aaron's support as uh, I share this screen and try to get us moving on thyroid eye disease. Um, so over the next 25 minutes or so, we'll go through thyroid eye disease and what we've learned through research uh, over the years. Uh, it's a very difficult disease, and it's it's great that we're getting the word out about this disease during this first Thyroid Eye Disease Awareness Week that's going on right now. So the objectives of the talk are really fourfold. Uh, an overview of thyroid eye disease, and in particular talking a bit about the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, we'll review what the disease looks like clinically, and then what those clinical signs and symptoms caused by way of functional and psychosocial burden on patients. And then we'll talk about our treatment options uh, for the disease. So first, an overview of thyroid eye disease, also known as TED or TED for short. I try to usually uh, say the full name just so people don't get confused. This is a, a debilitating, uh, progressive, and, and vision-threatening autoimmune disease. And um, it comes on for patients uh, over a period of weeks to months. And they have not only vision-threatening issues, uh, but disfigurement. 
And that all leads to trouble with work, with social life, and with psycho and psychosocial distress. And we'll go through uh, the different uh, ramifications of the disease as we move through this talk. Now, it's important to understand that thyroid eye disease is the most common extrathyroidal manifestation of Graves' disease. And many of us are familiar with Graves' disease or have heard of it. Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease are two separate autoimmune disease processes that oftentimes happen together. So about 90% of patients with thyroid eye disease will also have Graves' disease. But it's important to note that there are some patients who develop thyroid eye disease who don't have Graves' disease, who are hypothyroid or euthyroid, normal thyroid levels. In patients with Graves' disease, about 50% of them will develop thyroid eye disease. And so it's really important for patients with Graves' disease to have an ophthalmic exam, a baseline exam, to see if they have even mild signs of the disease that could progress over time. Now, in terms of demographics and risk factors for the disease. Um, there's really a bimodal age distribution for the disease, typically peaking in the 40s and the 60s. The disease itself is more common in women to men, about four to one uh, by way of uh, women uh, getting this disease more often than men. Your most common patient is gonna be a 40 to 50 year old woman. Now, that being said, there are some risk factors that make the disease either last longer in that progressive inflammatory phase or more severe or both. Um, smoking is a big one. Um, that increases the risk by about eight times. Additionally, one of the ways um, Graves hyperthyroidism is treated is with radioactive iodine treatment, and that can worsen or cause uh, the exacerbation of thyroid eye disease. While I mentioned women are more common to get the disease, the disease tends to be more severe in men than women, and in particular in older men. Now, what happens with this disease? Well, it really goes through an early progressive inflammatory component. And during this time, um, the patients uh, are gonna be fluctuating. They're going to have inflammatory signs and symptoms, which we'll talk about we'll talk about. And then eventually over time, and that's typically two to three years, um, fibrosis or scarring sets in. And then, and then a, a, a more stable phase of the disease develops, but the patients typically are left with lasting negative sequelae, both functional and, um, and uh, aesthetic, uh, after um, the fibrotic phase uh, ensues. Um, the, we've learned a lot about the pathophysiology of this disease uh, through research, and in particular through the research of Terry Smith out of the University of Michigan and, and Kellogg Eye Center. Um, he's an endocrinologist who's basically, his life work is on this slide. Um, and not all of it, but this is one of his major contributions to us. And, and basically what we're looking at is what drives the inflammatory process in thyroid eye disease. This is the orbital fibroblast, a cell that lives around the eye structures. And if you look at the edge of uh, the orbital fibroblast, which is the kind of that purplish um, cell wall, on top of it is something called the insulin growth factor one receptor. And that's, that's in red on the diagram. That commingles with the TSH receptor. And autoantibodies, an autoimmune disease, can stimulate or stimulates the insulin growth factor one receptor. There's some discussion between that receptor and the thyroid uh, stimulating hormone receptor. And then a downstream cascade of inflammation ensues within the orbit, the area around the eyes. There's cytokine production, uh, hyaluronan production, and this is what drives the inflammation in the orbit. And so what does that actually mean for us in terms of patients and what they look like? Well, in a normal eye in orbit, um, we obviously have things around the eye in the orbit. We have eyelids, we have eye muscles, we have fat behind our eyes, um, but all of those things uh, sort of are in the correct uh, amount and size and allow our eye to sit in the orbit in a correct position. When a patient has thyroid eye disease and that inflammatory cascade ensues, the one we just talked about with the insulin growth factor receptor being stimulated by an autoantibody, we get swelling of the muscles around the eyes. That includes even the muscles within the eyelids themselves and also the fat, the fat behind the eye swells. And so these, this complex of, 
uh, issues is what sh is what translates to the clinical presentation of thyroid eye disease. And so what happens? What do we see? Well, the most common thing we see in over 90% of patients with thyroid eye disease is upper eyelid retraction. And that's shown on the left here, also lower eyelid retraction. So the upper and lower eyelids, because of that inflammation, they pull away from, uh, from the eye itself. And we see white around the colored part of the eye. That's called scleral show. And that's abnormal. Um, this is uncomfortable for patients. The eyes may not close all the way when they sleep, uh, and that's called lagophthalmos. Now, the extraocular muscles and fat also expand, and so in about 60% of patients, they develop something called exophthalmos or proptosis, which basically means the eyes bulge out of the eye socket. So you can you combine these two things. These are the two most common things we see, eyelid retraction and the eyes pushing outward from the eye socket. And the eyes are now too exposed to air and they're not closing well. This is gonna cause um, discomfort for patients and dry eye. And so you can see on the left side, this is a patient who has inflammatory signs of the disease. And oftentimes these come because the patient has dryness, the eye is too exposed to the air. So they get chemosis, conjunctival hyperemia. These are the, the sort of red redness that you see in the eyes on this patient. They may have difficulty with light sensitivity, foreign body sensation, a sandy, gritty feeling in the eyes. Um, and all that kind of amounts to something called exposure keratopathy. The eyes are too exposed. They don't close well. They dry out. The corneas dry out. Um, and all that can also lead to uh, blurry vision and, and tearing. Now, in about 50% of patients, extraocular muscle disturbances develop because remember, those muscles behind the eyes are swollen and inflamed and then eventually develop fibrosis or scarring. And so the eyes may not line up in a roughly half of patients. When that happens, patients see two images instead of one. And this can be uh, really the, the, the worst functional uh, sequelae for, for the vast majority of these patients because it's very, very difficult to function uh, seeing two images instead of one. So, you know, one of the things about thyroid eye disease, it presents in so many different ways. It's a very heterogeneous disease. Um, every time I think I've seen every way thyroid eye disease can present, I see another patient presenting in a different way. I um, mean, that can be really difficult for physicians and for patients. Um, but what we do know is there's this short-term inflammatory uh, component of the disease. Um, I actually would probably not even say short-term. It's typically a few years. Um, but patients during that time have signs of inflammation. So they may have discomfort, swelling of the eyes or even the face, redness of the eyes, um, and swelling of the conjunctiva. And then over time, as they develop into the fibrotic phase of the disease, they can be stuck with certain sequelae that without some form of treatment, um, they have to you know, essentially live with. And we'll talk about treatments later, but they can be stuck with the proptosis, with double vision, even in its worst forms with, with vision loss from optic neuropathy. We do uh, try to quantify the inflammatory uh, component of the disease. And um, while different providers use different systems, the most commonly agreed upon one is the clinical activity score or the CAS, um, where patients basically get a score of one to seven the first time you see a patient. And then uh, on subsequent visits, they can go up to a score of 10. The higher the score, the more inflammation. Um, and so these are all the things we've been talking about in terms of inflammation, um, spontaneous orbital pain, pain when the eyes move, eyelid swelling, eyelid redness or erythema, conjunctival uh, redness, chemosis, which is swelling of the conjunctiva, and inflammation in the caruncle, caruncle or plica, which basically is the inner corner of the uh, eye, get, gets red and inflamed. Now, what does it do to the patient? So we've talked about kind of how it looks to us as physicians um, seeing these patients, but what does that really mean for the patients? Well, number one, there's functional issues that develop. Um, the patients have trouble with vision. And as we know, vision is hugely important for, for everything we do. Um, and so um, most commonly they get dry eye. Again, that's from that exposure. And when that happens, the vision's not only blurry, but they may have light sensitivity um, and difficulty uh, you know, spending time on a computer or reading for extended periods of time. 
Double vision or diplopia happens in about 50% of patients. As I mentioned, I think this functionally is the hardest one for, for patients because when you're used to seeing one image and all of a sudden you now see two images or you can't figure out you know, where the lanes are when you're driving your car, um, it, it, it can cause you to not be able to do the things you used to be able to do. And its worst form, um, the swelling of the muscles can basically push upon the optic nerve in the back part of the eye, and that can create uh, permanent vision loss. It's called optic neuropathy, compressive optic neuropathy, and patients can have reduced color vision, visual field defects, and even um, permanent visual loss. Now, I mentioned proptosis because you know it's really a telltale um, sign of thyroid eye disease. In fact, you know, when you Google it, those are the types of pictures you're going to see. And, and in medical school, they'll tell, uh, you know, medical students, this is a diagnosis you can make from across the room. And then patients look like they have bulging eyes. Um, when we measure this, any, any change of two millimeters or more matters to us as oculoplastic surgeons. So when we see a patient who has either a two millimeter change in where their eye sits in the eye socket, or when the eyes are two millimeters different from side to side, we, we know we need to evaluate this. And again, this leads to exposure, trouble closing the eyes. And sometimes you wind up even having to tell patients, you know, when you go to sleep, tape your eye closed or, you know, tape your eye closed during the day because it's drying out so much. Um, I, I know we've kind of harped on um, uh, diplopia, but it's really debilitating. Um, and, and, you know, in these patients, um, this double vision, it really can, it can be present all the time in some patients. It can be present when they're really tired uh, or just upon wakening. Um, and there are certain scales we can use. One is called the Gorman Diplopia Scale, uh, which is a scale that allows us to kind of rank from zero uh, up to four, a four-point scale, um, how much double vision they have. Correction, it's zero to three, but it's a four-point scale. Three meaning that a patient has double vision all the time. Um, and so um, we consider in, in, in our world of uh, oculoplastics, a change of one in that scale to, to matter to patients, to matter to their ability to function. The, the disfigurement that occurs with thyroid eye disease, um, you, you can't talk enough about it. I mean, these are patients that typically are, you know, in their mid-40s that over a period of weeks to months um, go from looking completely normal to a, a, an, an entirely different person. And um, so th these things lead to psychosocial issues for patients. And one of the, the studies that I like to mention uh, along that regard is a study that compared patients with um, moderate, with a new diagnosis of moderate or severe thyroid eye disease um, in terms of their anxiety and depression scales to patients with a new diagnosis of cancer, same anxiety and depression scales. And, and they found that they, they were similar. Patients getting this thyroid eye disease felt as anxious and as depressed as patients with a new diagnosis of cancer. And so as, as physicians and, and care providers, I, I think the onus is on us to, say, to talk to patients and find out how this disease is affecting them from a social perspective, from a work perspective, from a life perspective. So um, there's broad implications for patients' lives. Um, there's diminished quality of life. This has been shown in multiple studies. Um, and that happens because of the, the combination of all of these functional impacts, the double vision, uh, the difficulty seeing, the blurry vision, the discomfort in the eyes, the drastic change in appearance. And so these are patients that oftentimes will um, stay home more, avoid uh, Zoom calls, avoid putting their video on, um, you know, lo lose their job. I I've heard all of these things, lose, lose their spouse. Um, and so um, it, the quality of life is something that we really have to think about uh, in these patients, along with, of course, the function. How about treatment options? So um, there's a, a range of treatment options that we'll get to, but this is a curve that's called Rundle's curve. It's a very famous curve within uh, the, the thyroid eye disease world. It basically shows disease activity uh, compared to, along with time. And what happens is the disease has this progressive phase where they have inflammation and pain, typically lasting about three, two to three years, um, longer in smokers uh, and patients who have those risk factors we talked about earlier. And then eventually it settles into a fibrotic 
component of the disease where where basically the patients are sort of stuck with whatever they're left with, you know, whether it's uh, double vision, strabismus, proptosis, eyelid retraction, um, they're stuck in that place. They're not really going to change much from there. Now, the key here is, you know, we want to be able to treat these patients in this rectangle, in the early component of the disease, try to flatten this curve so that the patients, when this disease has gotten to the fibrotic component, they don't have all those negative sequelae um, that we know they can get. And so we have certain things we do. Um, a lot of them are supportive in nature. Um, so we're doing um, things for the dryness of their eyes, things like artificial tears or medicated eye drops uh, for dryness. Um, we recommend uh, typically selenium supplementation, which is an antioxidant that's been shown to help patients, especially with mild disease. That was a study done in Europe, but we still recommend it in the States. Um, steroids have been used for quite some time on this disease, and those can either be IV or oral steroids. Um, they do come with quite a side effect profile, as, as, as anybody who's treated patients with steroids or, or had to take steroids themselves. And that's a bit of a shotgun approach. It basically is, you know, um, treating inflammation everywhere, um, but not a, not a targeted one. Um, orbital radiation has been used to limit the amount of steroid that has to be given to a patient. Um, we have biologics. We have an FDA-approved biologic that um, uh, inhibits the insulin growth factor one receptor. So that's a targeted uh, way to treat uh, the inflammatory cascade that ensues. And then surg surgery is an option that, for most patients, is reserved for the fibrotic phase of the disease. You know, once they're stuck with the sequelae uh, of proptosis, we can consider decompressing the orbit. I'll show you a bit about what that looks like. We can consider fixing the double vision, um, and then we can consider adjusting the eyelid heights, uh, all with surgical options. So these are invasive surgeries. Um, they're typically done in this order, and so they're staged procedures. Uh, not every patient needs every one, um, but some need a lot of surgeries. And so orbital decompression basically involves uh, exposing various walls of the orbit and removing bone back behind the eye to allow for more space. The, the orbit's a, a, a bony box, essentially. I mean, it's pear-shaped, but it's a box. It's a closed space. And so we make that space larger to allow for that swollen tissue to have more space. We can also remove the swollen fat behind the eye. Um, that's called fat decompression surgery. These are pretty big surgeries, especially the bone decompressions. Um, and they're oftentimes staged, you know, one side done, heal, the other side done, heal. Um, one big risk with orbital decompression surgery is development or worsening of double vision because you're basically changing the shape of the orbit and the muscles then go into different positions. So the second thing that has to happen for many patients is strabismus surgery or adjusting where the eye muscles sit against the eye to try to give patients uh, single vision, especially in what we call primary gaze, which is straight ahead gaze, or in down gaze, because we live most of our lives in those two positions, working on computers and reading. Um, these are difficult strabismus cases. Uh, oftentimes, patients need one or more surgeries to get in a decent place. And then the last step is eyelid surgery to adjust for that eyelid retraction, to, to lower upper eyelids, to raise lower eyelids. Um, uh, all these things, you know, have varying degrees of success. They're certainly they're certainly not perfect, but we can oftentimes get patients to a, a better place with uh, with stage surgeries. So um, it's important, as, as I mentioned at the onset, to to really get these thyroid eye disease patients uh, into specialists soon. Um, and so, you know, at Cornell, we've set up a multi-specialty group uh, that combines endocrinologists with our oculoplastic and neuro-ophthalmologists who, who are the specialists for this disease. And we almost have a trigger mechanism, a uh, reflex mechanism. When a patient has Graves' disease, they, they get an ophthalmo ophthalmology exam as a baseline even, just as a baseline. Um, we want to find out if they have any of the early sequelae, if they have uh, significant, moderate, or severe sequelae. Um, we can look back at patient photos even to see when things have developed and then talk to the patients about their quality of life. Um, we, we, we monitor them for that clinical activity score um, and uh, for visual function and uh, their optic nerve. And oftentimes they need imaging. CAT scans or MRIs, um, you can see on the bottom here, a CAT scan with the muscles uh, of the eye quite swollen in this example. 
So just to summarize, uh, thyroid eye disease is a debilitating, progressive, vision-threatening autoimmune disease. Uh, early referral to specialists is important. Um, we we want to get the baseline on these patients. We want to be able to treat the patients who need treatment uh, early in, in that progressive phase of the disease before it gets uh, too high up on that curve. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Smith and others' work, um, we know that the insulin growth factor one receptor plays a, a crucial role in driving the inflammatory cascade that ensues in the orbit um, through the level of the orbital fibroblast. Uh, patients can experience really you know, profound functional changes and also changes in their appearance, and that can affect their quality of life. Uh, once thyroid eye disease hits the fibrotic phase, uh, oftentimes surgery is our option. Um, patients may need multiple surgeries. Um, the surgeries can have varying results. Uh, and, um, you know, effective management for this disease requires early diagnosis uh, and treatment, and then active monitoring and intervention uh, when needed. And so um, I think that brings me to the end of uh, the talk. Um, I think we did it in 25 minutes exactly. So I will um, I will turn the, the pro program back over. Thanks, Dr. Lully. Um, as a transition to my discussion with Christine, I would like to ask Dr. Lully two quick questions. And again, this is going to give Christine some food for thought too. Um, Dr. Lully, um, I know that you mentioned that there is a team approach that you take at Wild Cornell. Uh, number one, um, is that typical across the country, or is that primarily at a um, more of a university-based hospital cis, uh, setting? And secondly, who'd be involved, like the, the subspecialties in progressive TED versus when a patient's in fibrotic TED? Uh, Jim, great questions. Uh, so um, the team approach is um, probably not typical everywhere, although these patients do require co-management. You know, they, they're going to typically need an endocrinologist and an eye care specialist. Um, I think there are certain sort of centers of excellence for thyroid eye disease, um, uh, Kellogg Eye Center uh, being probably one of the first ones that did this, uh, UCLA. Um, uh, we're, we're thankful at Cornell that we've set this up. Um, so I think some of the larger academic centers will set up um, a, a broader approach to these patients, um, almost like a tumor board would, would be set up where, you know, you meet uh, monthly or quarterly, you discuss difficult patients. In some settings, you know, uh, you'll even have the endocrinologist and the eye specialist seeing the patients together. So I do think that's a, a bit of a specialized approach, um, but you still need a team. Even if you're in private practice, um, you, you want to develop that team. Um, and uh, remind me of the second part of your question. I'm sorry. Yes. And in um, I know you mentioned uh, a uh, end, uh, endocrinologist, ophthalmologist involved. I right. assume you were talking about primarily progressive TED. Um, what during the fibrotic phase? I guess there's a specialty surgeon that's involved then. Yeah, sorry. So right, um, typically the specialists from the eye side are going to be oculoplastic surgeons and neuroophthalmologists. Um, and when surgery becomes uh, a question, it's the oculoplastic surgeons that that are the ones that do that surgery. Um, but generally speaking, it's the same specialist providing care uh, throughout the disease course. So you know, it'll be an endocrinologist. It'll be a specialty trained ophthalmologist. Um, you may require uh, help from uh, radiation oncology. You may require help from radiology um, and even psychiatry, you know, to help patients who are struggling um, with depression or anxiety. Great, thank you. And then my second question, and again, this is something that maybe Christine can talk about when she's uh, chatting with me, is um, uh, this year, obviously in all of these congressional briefings, especially those being held virtually because of COVID-19. Um, my question for you is, how has COVID-19 affected how you're treating TED patients um, at Cornell? Yeah, um, so uh, it's affected everything, as we know. Um, we developed uh, a pretty robust um, telemedicine uh, and tele-ophthalmology uh, offering uh, directly related to COVID. Um, and we were supposed to do that regardless of COVID, but it was going to be about a year-long project, and we did it in about two weeks. 
Um, so we can see a lot of these patients via telemedicine, um, and we've gotten really creative in that regard. And in some patients who require um, infusion type therapies, um, we have shifted to some home infusions as opposed to bringing patients into hospital settings. I mean, it basically is up to patient comfort, and a lot of our patients prefer to have a nurse come to their home to help give them treatment as opposed to um, uh, come into the hospital. And, and just the practicalities during COVID-19 in terms of masking or shielding, um, and again, Christine can comment on this, but um, since um, many TED uh, patients already have dry eye issues um, uh, and, and a mask on your face, if not properly placed, can be forcing hot air towards your eyes. Um, what have you found with most patients in terms of ma uh, uh, masking or shielding? Yeah, it's even worse. You're totally right. You bring up a great point. Um, without a really good fit, uh, you're going to have air hitting the eyes and they're going to dry out even more. So all those dry eye sequelae we talked about are going to be worse. Um, certainly for patients with thyroid eye disease and even for just, you know, patients with, with normal eyes. I, I, we're seeing a lot more dry eye. We're seeing a lot more uh, issues with um, chalasia or styes. And I think it's related to um, the masking. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lovely. And just obviously stay with us for more questions. But I'd like to turn now to a, a discussion with Christine G, our patient advocate. Um, uh, in, in all fairness, I want to be honest and say that I met Christine last year. Uh, Christine spoke on Capitol Hill um, uh, about her journey in life with, with TED. Um, and one thing I noticed with Christine, as well as the other TED patients I've spoken with, they are amazing individuals. They're troopers. They carry on with life as best they can, no matter what's kind of thrown at them with respect to visual conditions and, 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 and um, um, other changes in their lives. So Christine, thank you for, for waiting to, um, to me to ask a couple of questions. And maybe you can comment on those sometime during our little discussion um, here, the, the ones that Dr. Lully spoke about. But could you briefly um, introduce yourself and say a little bit about your life right now? Sure, yes, Jim, thank you. Thank you for having me here. And to Dr. Lelly, that was, um, you know, it's interesting to see the clinical side of, you know, the real life thing that I went through. So, um, yeah, so I am from Monterey, California. Um, that's where I am right now and uh, very much appreciate being here. Um, so I wanted to say something about the photo, uh, if you are able to see the photo of me. Um, that was the first photo, it was taken just about one year ago, and that was the first photo of me um, for 10 years. So I um, did not get in front of cameras or mirrors, um, just everything from Dr. Lelly's presentation you can imagine that if it happened to you, you would not be wanting someone to point a camera at you um, or, or even look in the mirror. So um, this is, that photo was taken about probably a month after the sixth surgery uh, that I had on my eyes for thyroid eye disease or TED. Uh, so yeah, and I very, um, just very much appreciate being here and being able to um, be part of the education, uh, helping people to know about thyroid eye disease and to um, just know what to look out for for themselves and their loved ones. So yeah, that's kind of current. Christine, could you could you tell us when you first noticed uh, symptoms and then did you go and, and consult uh, with a medical professional? Tell us a little bit of, about that part of your journey, the start of this. Sure, so that would be 11 years ago. And I was um, living just a very normal life, like, you know, maybe, you know, everyone on this call, I would, if I was on this call, I would be thinking, oh my gosh, if that happened to me, what would I do? And um, it's, that's a good question because for me, it just came completely out of the blue. So um, I, you know, I, like I said, I live in Monterey. I own my own business, website design, photography, uh, mostly in the hospitality. 
uh, for hospitality clients and really love it. I'm married, have a wonderful husband. That in the photo is our little cat, Sweet Pea, little Siamese. And um, so I was just, you know, had all the normal day-to-day -day things that everybody has. And then I started noticing um, that I had very rapid heartbeat and I was getting a lot of anxiety. And I have anxiety like everybody has anxiety, but this was like really dialed up anxiety. And um, then my facial features started to change as well. It was, it came on really fast, just in a matter, it seemed like weeks, just a matter of weeks. And um, so then my eyes became very red and the gritty, you know, the, all the things that Dr. Lely said and then very quickly, um, my eyelids did retract and my eyes became very exposed. And it did not take long for them to begin pushing out of their sockets. And so that swelling um, behind my eyes was came really quickly. So I um, was at a doctor just for a routine check. And I said, um, it seems like one of my eyes is closing. And he said, hmm. And he, he had photos of me from before, so he took some photos and he said, compared to me, he said, I actually think one of your eyes is opening, which makes the other one look like it's closing. And so um, he said, and then I, he said, have you had any other symptoms? And I explained to him about, usually my heart's like 60 beats a minute. Um, it was 120 resting. So, and it made it hard to sleep because my heart was just pounding so hard. And um, so I just told him the different things I was experiencing. He said, that sounds like something's going on with your thyroid. We should get it tested. So they tested it and then right away they fast tracked me. Like the day they got the results, they got me over to the endocrinologist because the numbers as the endocrinologist said were the highest that she had ever seen. And it was quite amazing because I'm athletic. I swim the mile every day when um, it's not COVID. So um, because they closed the swimming pool, which has been pretty devastating, but um, instead I, I bicycle. So I have been thousands of miles on my bicycle. I ride two hours a day I'm out in Pebble Beach, 17 mile drive, if you know it, it's lovely. So um, anyway, I, I rode my bike over to the endocrinologist and walked in looking, you know, not too different than I look in this picture. And she thought, this is not, um, you know, this doesn't match up. She said, this is not your test because for anyone with these numbers, you would just be not here <laughs> looking like this, but it was true. And it was, I did have it and it progressed very fast. And eventually what happened is that my eyes um, pushed all the way out of their sockets so that um, all my lower eyes were just actually spilling out. And so um, the implications of that was that um, you know, going to see my clients, shooting photos, all the things that I would do, even going to the sports center um, to swim, I um, became very um, cautious, just very cautious. So I, I didn't want to stop my life. I had worked really hard. I had pretty rough beginnings and I was making a conscious effort to build a good life for myself and put a lot into it. So I really didn't want to be sidelined. I didn't want to just have to sit by the sideline and watch everybody else live life. And I, I could see that that would be a problem um, with this um, Graves disease and the thyroid eye disease. So um, I just dis determined like very early on, not even knowing what I was facing is to do well with it. And I think, you know, maybe others on this call might feel the same way. You're presented with something, maybe it's it's cancer or someone you love with heart disease or, and, and you just think inside yourself, you think I'd like to do well with this. Whatever is up ahead, I wanna do well with it. So that is, you know, basically that was my approach is I just, so I, the medical help I got was um, not very good. So to be perfectly honest, it was not very good. If I had known about Dr. Lelly and his team, I would have been there but I didn't know about them. I didn't know about thyroid eye disease. I thought it was all part of Graves' disease. It was just a symptom of it. The endocrinologist um, didn't really talk to me about it. She just ran the numbers, took blood tests, 
ran the numbers. If they were good, she was happy. If they weren't good, she was, you know, felt that it was um, a reflection on her, to be quite honest. And so um, I, at one point, I did see an eye specialist and um, I, you know, I got a little bit of help, but not, it was not very much. So um, that's, you know, part of why I like to, um, if, you know, like Jim, if he says, would you like to um, speak about this? I think yes, because if I could help other people, um, maybe fast track um, the help that they get and get the right kind of help, um, it's huge. And then they wouldn't have to, like for me, was like walking down a dark hall, looking for an opening, looking for an open door, um, looking for a little bit of light. And I spent a long time in that hallway, um, you know, just kind of feeling my way along. And, you know, eventually um, I did find what I needed uh, to get the help that I needed, but it was a, it was a long journey for sure. Um, so hope I'm answering your question, Jim, is there? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. And just, um... So for clarification, so essentially you went to your just your regular doctor uh, and, and during a, a, a checkup, basically, that doctor um, said, you know, I think something's going on here. So then you went to an endocrinologist. Then eventually you did um, see a, an eye specialist. And obviously, since you've had several surgeries, um, um, uh, eventually you also uh, saw an oculoplastic surgeon. But it sounds to me, Christine, like, you kind of had to be your own best patient advocate and sort of seek out the treatment. There wasn't sort of this, um, from what I can sense, this kind of automatic team that Dr. Lully was talking about, like they have at Cornell. Right, yeah, that is completely right, Jim. And so today there are, you know, like there's like support groups, uh, there's websites. Um, one of the things that I found that really turned things around for me oddly enough, is YouTube, is we were do-it-yourselfers. And so if the kitchen sink, you know, something goes wrong with it, we go to YouTube and say, how do you fix this? And there's always someone like really bright that, that wants to share about it. And so after doing enough of those do-it-yourselfers, I thought, I wonder if I could find anything about this Graves disease. Because all I was just finding was just like these little write-ups. And that's what I was going by. And um, so I went on to the YouTube and I was surprised that there were, you know, like I met a Dr. Douglas and he um, eventually is the one who did the surgery right before the photo that you see here where he moved my eyes backwards. And it was a huge surgery, absolutely huge. And so um, it's good I was used to not looking in mirrors because I didn't look in the mirror for, you know, at least a month after that surgery. Um, until some things could could settle down, um, but there but there is a lot of help now, and it's just so encouraging what Dr. Lowy said that if you could just you know if people can educate themselves and yeah like look at YouTube because the other thing on YouTube is people were telling their stories. Now I'd never met anybody who had eyes that looked like mine, and I stayed out in the world. I I worked and I you know swam and I did everything everything I would normally do, but I still did not meet anybody that had, you know, my, my situation. So, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really great that that is available now. And um, so people don't have to be alone uh, with it and then they can get the help that they need and not have to, you know, feel lost. Yes. And Christine, uh, just so everybody knows, so uh, you actually had um, the active stage at a time when there was no treatment for it. So you actually went to the fibrotic stage and you had to have the surgeries to deal with that. So essentially, uh, there was really not a lot of treatment for you uh, in your um, uh, active phase of the disease, correct? That's correct, right. And then the one, the one eye doctor I went to, um, it was just the endocrinologist said, I think there's somebody who sees patients like you, you should go see them. And I went to see him and when I walked in and he said, well, how long have your eyes been bulging? It's like, well, okay. <laughs> so I told him and they took some measurements on my eyes and he said, well, you know, you're, you're still like in an active phase. He said, so just use lots of drops and then eventually it'll settle down and then you may need extra help. 
why don't you come back and see me at that time? And that was it. That was, I know Dr. Lilly's probably horrified <laughs> that someone would do that, but he did. And so I was just back, you know, back into the dark hallway to, you know. To and you're not talking about a long time ago. You're talking about what, like you said, about 11 years ago? So, you know, so that would be, that was maybe like five years ago, six okay. years ago. So yeah, in the, you know, in the progression of it. So, so then when I was watching the YouTube and I, and so Dr. Douglas, at the, he's in Los Angeles. So he was talking about what thyroid eye disease is specifically, um, what can be done, how people are affected. And he just has some really wonderful videos. And so um, I, I connected up with him. And so he moved my eyes backwards significantly that was surgery six. Now I've already I've had eight surgeries. I'm done. Like everything is all right. But when he moved my eyes back, I um, I couldn't see. I wasn't blind, but I had um, when I met you last year, Jim. I still had stitches in my eyes um, from the strabismus um, surgery because I after moving my eyes back in the photo that you see here, I actually can't see. I, as I look, I was seeing, um, my husband took the picture, I saw two of him, and one of them was like way far away from the other one and kind of up sitting on a fence. And so it was um, that way for six months. So I still, I actually didn't say anything to anybody. I just, you know, like I tried to navigate on my bicycle. Um, I tried to swim my laps, although I couldn't tell where the lane was. Um, and I had to, I bumped into a lot of things. So, uh, but then a wonderful doctor um, at Stanford was able to correct my vision. So now I can see perfectly fine. And I did, like Dr. Lully said, then I had to have my eyes adjusted because one didn't exactly look like the other. So that was surgery eight and the last one. So um, yeah, that's, it's, you know, I think now there's better options, much better options for someone like me uh, and anybody else who, you know, comes along newly diagnosed is it's a really good time. It, there's no good time to get thyroid eye disease, but if you, if you got it now, as opposed to 11 years ago with all the education that's going on, I want to thank Horizon because they are Part of um, I think what you're doing here and they are very big advocates of education and so um, yeah it's you know it's really great that there is so many resources now and Christine just to, to let everybody know you've mentioned dr. Douglas from UCLA um, uh, dr. Douglas did speak at last year's briefing did an excellent job and yes uh, horizon therapeutics uh, is an AVER member organization, and we work very closely on this education. Um, Christine, so, you know, one of the things, and, and, and I think Dr. Lully did a, had excellent PowerPoint presentation. It almost, it almost talks itself, but, um, it, you know, it shows you that even during the, um, the surgeries for the fibrotic stage, you know, one surgery doesn't solve everything. In fact, one surgery may fix one problem, but create another problem, like you said, with the fact that your eyes were put put back into the sockets, but then you really couldn't see straight, and so you would have strabismus surgery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you know it's quite it is quite a journey. You have to be up for it. Like and again, like what Dr. Lowy said, is the emotional impact can be um, pretty devastating. So I would think you know this whole journey it has been devastating, but also exhilarating because it's like you know, trying to navigate through something that is an unknown, complete unknown. And one of the things that happened for me is that I couldn't really be around little children because they, I frightened them the way that I looked with my eyes super red and pushed out. And, you know, at the very best, they would say, mommy, what's wrong with her? And um, at the very least, they would start to, to cry, you know, and just hide behind their parents. And that was a horrible experience. So, and even like, say, Halloween, I wouldn't answer the door on Halloween. And if little kids were in the um, locker room, you know, where I would go to swim, I would just keep my eyes lowered. You know, I would try not to look at them. I would, you know, it was really hard. 
And I try to tell you just briefly that um, before the sports center closed um, for the COVID, uh, a little girl came up to me and she said, um, can I ask you a question? And I thought, oh my gosh. So I braced myself emotionally. She wouldn't know what happened inside of me, but um, I thought, oh my gosh. And she said, I wanted to know what is your favorite color? And I said, oh, I said, well, it's purple. And I said, and what is your favorite color? And she said, well, it's pink. And she said, you see this little dress and wearing this? She started just talking to me like normal. And I thought, she's talking to me like normal. And she's looking at me and she's talking to me, just this little girl that's all lit up with life. And I just, oh my gosh, I just thought, oh, I'm on the other side. You know, like that was my feeling. I thought I'm on the other side of this and yes. it's over, yeah. So Christine, from a practical perspective too, um, you know, your journey has taken you across the country to seek treatment and up and down the West Coast. I know you live outside of Monterey, but you've been yeah. up to Stanford and, and down to UCLA, et cetera. So, you know, um, we don't normally talk about insurance issues or access issues or things like that, but, you know, clearly the team approach at an academic institution certainly would uh, provide a much more practical uh, route for patients rather than, you know, what you've gone through in terms of really having to seek out treatment all over the country. You know, it's it's so right. And when I was listening to Dr. Lelly, I thought, gosh, to have a team of people that would just care about you, like on all sides, you know, they care about your emotions, they care about your physical appearance, about, you know, how your eyes work or don't work, and that they would work together to look out for you is, to me, it's inconceivable. It's just, it's such a beautiful thing. It's not what I experienced, um, but I would love it if other people could experience that. And, you know, like I said, that they could find the answers that they need, the support that they need, because it just would make it so much easier um, to, you know, it's just that hallway just actually wouldn't even exist. You know, they would just be, you know, just embraced and helped. Yes. So, Christine, before I open it up to questions for both Dr. Lully and yourself, I did want to ask you, um, uh, without getting into specifics about, you know, drugs or et cetera, et cetera, but um, are you currently experiencing dry eye? Um, are you wearing a mask during COVID? Is the mask essentially, um, uh, um, are, are your eyes sensitive to wearing the mask, et cetera? I'd just like to know some practical implications of your life now after your last surgery. So I, um, I still need to wear, you know, like I use eye drops, but not nearly what I did before. And uh, with the mask wearing, yes, I have to, like yesterday I had a photo shoot. And so again, I'm a photographer as part of my work. And I can't wear the mask and shoot photos at the same time. It's just too hard on my eyes. So um, I just have to, you know, kind of deal with that. Um, so yeah, it's my eyes and my eyes have a lot of light sensitivity, light sensitivity, even though they look pretty normal. I look just like you guys now. <laughs> um, but I, I am very sensitive to light, bright lights. Yes. So, so yeah. Oh. So some of the symptoms still remain. And when you said eye drops, were those eye drops specifically hydrating eye drops because of dry eye? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Um, great, Christine. Well, again, you are a trooper. You're an inspiration to us all. And again, um, thank you for sharing your story with us and the fact that you know you really have been your own best advocate and reaching out and like I said, crisscrossing the country to make sure that you got you know good treatment. Uh, fortunately, now there is a, a treatment for the the active phase of the disease, and of course, folks should do their own education about that. Um, Dr. Lelly, I hope you're still with us. I'm still here. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have a question from the audience, and that is, um, uh, can you describe the prevalence of TED in the United States? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's um, thyroid eye disease occurs in 16 out of every 100,000 women, and I believe three out of every 100,000 men. Um, and again, you know, remember that 
Graves' disease, which is relatively common, about half of patients with Graves' disease will have um, signs or symptoms of thyroid eye disease. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions popping up here. Uh, if again, for those listening, uh, if there's anything else you would like to know, um, I'm looking at my own set of, of questions here too, so bear with me a, a second here. Um, so, um, Christine, um, one of the things, like I mentioned earlier, is that despite every kind of monkey wrench that's thrown at, 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 at TED patients, they just seem to try to just, you know, try to move forward um, and, and, you know, and have the best quality of life they possibly can. Um, have you talked to and dealt with a lot of other um, um, TED patients on the, um, uh, like you, you talked about some of the message boards and things like that? And, um, you know, what's been your impression? Yes. So that's just a great question. And so, you know, it's really hard to just stay out there in life. And, and I think that actually what I'm encountering is that it's more common for people to pull in, that they are more likely to sideline themselves and to define themselves by someone with thyroid eye disease or Graves disease, and they begin to limit their life. And so that is something that I really um, am also very passionate about is to be um, an advocate for other people to not do that um, instead of pulling in to reach out and to connect with other people and to challenge themselves to, um, you know, of course, take care of themselves, but not to, um, but not to withdraw from life um, as a result of it, because it's, um, it's, it's a solvable problem. Um, but it doesn't always feel that way when it's happening to you. It's, I think it's really easy, actually, Jim, to, um, to close the door, unplug the phone, and um, just, you know, isolate. So that is a thing that I want to be part of that education and reaching out to people and saying, don't do that because you only have one life. And if you, you know, if you lose part of your life because of that, it's not necessary. Yeah. And Christine, thank you for sharing that again. And, and again, you know, that's the one thing I keep hearing when I do talk to patients with TED is the, the isolation. And, you know, maybe the rest of society is starting to understand a little bit now because of COVID-19, the psychological implications of that isolation. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I think maybe there might be, you know, even a greater sensitivity now um, to uh, health conditions where individuals do feel isolated from society. Uh, Dr. Lowley, I, I'd like to finish on a positive note. And I think that, you know, you did give us hope in your presentation for treatment for the active phase uh, of the disease. Um, what do you see going on in the next 10 years and, and how is further research gonna, going to enter into this? Uh, sure, Jim. Uh, you know, um, the the one of the keys I think to where we are today compared to where Christine was uh, five and ten years ago is through research and through better understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease and where the inflammation is coming from. Um, and so we you know we know the insulin growth factor one receptor is involved in it. Um, and so you know that's a way science can target. Um, and there, that's probably not the only way that um, that inflammation occurs within the orbit and eyelid and eye muscles. And so further research and understanding of that mechanism, I think, uh, will be key over the next 10 years. And then I think understanding what's happening in that fibrotic phase and if there's any way that we can treat patients in that fibrotic phase that saves them from eight surgeries, uh, you know, I think... Um, better a better understanding of even though the patients appear stable to us clinically typically in that fibrotic phase is there an underlying mechanism that could still be targeted um uh, you know the targeted therapies really you know obviously make a lot of sense um i i would say that because of the advances in research um I, you know christine hearing your story i mean i i've i've been doing this now for 
12 years as an attending physician and, uh, you know, fellowship, we treat thyroid eye disease as well. Um, and I was trained uh, at, at Kellogg Eye Center, the, the same place that figured out the insulin growth factor one receptor. But back 15 years ago when I was there, you know, I was trained that this is a, a watch and wait disease, um, you know, manage symptoms as best as you can. And um, once it dies out, do surgery and and just you know try your best to um you know help the patient along by providing emotional support but you know really telling them they need to be patient and wait and um it doesn't have to be that way anymore um and it's it's just such a a, a better way i think for um for patients and providers as providers we want to treat you know we don't want to watch a disease go through the go through its course and until it's done and then try to treat. Uh, so um, I think that's, you know, um, kind of uh, that big difference is really what's what's been amazing for me to watch. Um, sad for me to hear Christine's story. But like you said, on a positive note, I, Christine, I love the story of the little girl in the locker room that that yeah, almost had me in tears. So I think that's just phenomenal. Great. Thank you. And, and Dr. Lully, thank you for being so passionate about your work. Uh, on on thyroid eye disease, um, and you know you make a very good point. And again, just generally speaking about vision research in general, uh, obviously the vision research that's funded by the National Eye Institute within the National Ooh. Institutes of Health, again thanks to annual congressional appropriations. Um, um, I want to acknowledge that. Also, a lot of the private in industry research that's going on right now the importance of this team approach uh, within an academic institution to sort of be, you know, from soup to nuts, everything that a, that a patient would need um, to, to diagnose, to treat this disease in the active phase, to deal with the fibrotic phase if it has not been adequately treated in the active phase. Um, you know, these are all hopeful signs for the future. Um, and we certainly do thank Dr. Lilly for his work uh, we thank you, Christine, for being absolutely so open about your experience with Ted. Um, it's funny because I literally envision you uh, biking down down a hillside, and um, thank goodness now that you know your vision is in the condition that uh, you know that you can do that and continue with your active lifestyle of work, of biking, of swimming, etc. Okay, so. Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody um, uh, uh, for today's, uh, paying attention for today's session. Um, again, um, Aaron, if you're on there, um, you can comment or I can, but um, I'll be developing a summary of this and posting it on the, the um, AVER website. And there'll also be a um, recording of this. Um, and Aaron, are you on? Can you comment on the recording? Sure, yeah. So today's session was recorded and will be available um, uh, with Aver, but also possibly on Arvo's website. Um, so we'll link to that. But thank you everyone for your participation today, for your questions, um, and for your time. Great. Thank you, Erin. And also, is Dr. Um, Lully's PowerPoint going to be available? Yes. So today's entire presentation, audio and visuals, will probably be, be available in the coming days. Great, Aaron. Thank you so much. And just uh, as we're closing here again, thank our speakers. Uh, thank Arvo. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, AVER member uh, Horizon Therapeutics for their support. And I just wanted to announce that this concludes this year's um, series of virtual congressional briefings on vision issues. And we're already working on a World Glaucoma Week virtual briefing for next year in early March. So if you participated in today's program, uh, you will be getting a notice about that. Uh, again, 24-7, um, 365, you can learn more about vision research and what's um, what it's meaning for patients on the um, AVER website at www.iresearch.org. Um, we also have on our front page a direct link to our September uh, 2020 virtual um, uh, International AMD Week uh, Awareness Week Congressional Briefing, and also a one-of-a-kind 
30 minute conversation with emerging vision scientists about the impact of COVID-19 lab closures uh, on uh, their career pathways. So again, you can watch any of these videos by clicking into www.iresearch.org. So thank you everybody and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Aaron, everybody. Dr. Lelly. Yes, thank you everybody. Wonderful to be here, thanks. Yeah, thank you.